on this channel I've already uploaded a video which is my introduction and I explained how this channel is for philosophy and ethics but then it occurred to me that I do English literature and language too so hello people that do English literature and language uh, A level um, hi if you're in my class, then you know that we are doing Robert Minhinick's Watching the Fire Eater. So this video shall help you. I'm going to read out the introduction and the chapter what and the chapter and chapter one. Am I doing English literature and language? If I can't speak proper English, um, um, what was I saying? Yeah, I'm going to read it out and then. In another video I'm going to do like a summary explaining it so if you physically want to read it then don't watch the rest of the video but if you want it explaining to you before tomorrow's lesson I'll put a link to the uh, summary of the chapter below so yeah introduction recently in Prague I observed a curious incident I was standing with a small crowd at the shrine in Winsalus Square, dedicated to Khan Palak, who burned himself to death in protest at the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Can't pronounce it myself. In 1968, a woman with a bunch of flowers stepped into the shrine area itself. She attempted to lay her bouquet with the numerous other floral tributes and scraps of writing that had been left within the small garden. Immediately, another woman, rotund almost elderly, detached herself from the crowd and began to abuse the tribute bringer. The first woman looked baffled, then startled, as the tirade continued. She attempted to shrug off the interruption and advanced further into the garden. The second woman pursued her and began to scream. She then attempted to beat the flowers from the other's hands. Failing in this, she started to rain blows on the back and shoulders of the second woman, who now, obviously considering discretion her wisest choice, retreated to the square after quickly scattering her blooms. Still shouting, but now rhetorically, and for the benefit of a small crowd, the attacker stood within the shrine and carefully picked up each of these flowers. With opera operatic disdain, she bent the stems and shook off the petals before flinging them away. Slowly we dispersed, leaving her muttering and triumphant. Putting together this collection of essays, I feel a little like the woman who ventured out of the square and into the garden. The keepers of such places are notoriously hard to please. Carry the wrong flowers, or have the nerve to trespass, and their reaction may be severe. Poets are often seduced by the melancholic pleasures of cultural alienation. This fiditiousness means their work is easy to dismiss, as a cry from the sidelines of life. This may apply to my poetry, or in this case my prose. Yet, here they are eight pieces from the last seven years, my nervous progress through the shrines. And if they are redundancies here, or talent to be startled by the seemingly obvious, so be it. Matters of the environment loom large, but for many we already live in an age of post-environmental concern that a brief period ago might have appeared a product of science fiction. America, too, is present. That endless source of precarious engagements with the dangerous and absurd but the bulk of collections taken up with Wales, a country of increasing, increasingly difficult to locate as it slows an identity of clichés. Time is not always kind to the essay, or not to the type I seem to write. And if it is true that those writers who look for consolation in their work are the ones most prepared to believe in lies, at least now I know where to begin the rest of the journey. Robert Minhinick, May 1992 Because I not good at enunciating words properly. I've got my dad to read out the first chapter, so off you go, Dad. Rio de Journal, Chapter 1. Be louder. It's oddly comforting to know that Rio de Janeiro, City of Marvels, has a branch of C&As. Two floors of dull clothes, not particularly cheap. No one in Copacabana but me, it seems, is wearing any of them. In fact, no one but me is wearing any clothes in Copacabana today. It's 10am and 38 degrees centigrade. I'm reluctant to take off my shirt because my tanning has so far been done in segments. Like some Gwent rugby team, I am decked out in red and white hoops, red knees, white shins 
black clark shoes with exhausted wafer-like heels. Everyone else has bare feet. The men pose where the surf breaks, muscles oiled like the grain of some dark tropical hardwood. The women, meanwhile, have all been to the dentists. Their bodies sport the Rio bikini known as dental floss. And an alarming garment, this, for someone brought up on the rolled up jeans and cover up everything just in case swimsuits of Trico Bay. All that Copacabana women wears is a brilliant G string and a pair of sunglasses. I look at the islands in the bay, fringed with tropical forest. I turn to the granite pinnacles of Corcovada with its immense concrete Christ, arms greeting all comers to the city. False icon, Rio, welcomes no one who cannot pay his way, and half Brazil's population, malnourished and illiterate, are too busy counting huge bankrolls of almost worthless old Cruzeiro notes to look that far into the sky. You reach the summit of Corcovado on the cog train, a slow ascent through Tijuca, the city's own remnant of Atlantic forest. Hummingbirds gleam in the flowers and plastics around the track. Electric blue butterflies, wings bigger than banknotes, float over the train on its way to an astounding view. But from here, the statue seems an, as incongruous as King Kong waving from the Empire State. I lie on the crystalline sand, its creamy demerara sprinkled with a million ring pulls and the brown lipsticked butts of Hollywood's vigilant against the heat, which I can actually feel doing me harm. I am also irradiate, irradiated by paranoia. Brazil is the second most violent country in the world. Colombia, to the north, tops the league. Rio is the capital of that violence, and the beach of Copacabana is the most likely place in the capital to get rolled. There's no way of disguising my foreigner status as I spread eagle on bath mat and struggle with a broken-spined Margaret Atwood. I've met plenty of pale Brazilians, but my pallor is different. It has the greeny look of the underside of a strawberry. There is something shameful about it, or obscene. In the streets, like everyone, everybody else, I wear dirty t-shirts and darn shorts, and still the posses of money changers, the street committee of orphans, with offers of stolen sweets and postcards, postcards home unerring in on my tropical virginity. But there are no obvious mobsters here. My neighbours are enormous rosewood-coloured grandmothers, hawkers with trays of coconut, a bodybuilder with face mutilated by the black slash of sunglasses, and a one-legged boy who has planted his crutch like a palm tree in the sand, as if defying the waves to fell it. Bring no money to the beach in the dictum. Is the dictum. Or only enough to appease. The sun lays on an anvil on my back. The surf shouts and murmurs deliriously, like a hospital ward at night. And when I rise, my body shines in a white chrysalis of sand. Opening my eyes is to emerge from a fever. The druggy traumas and insane dreams of meningitis I remember as a child. The doctor came and asked me to touch my throat with my chin. I couldn't. She pierced my spine with an enormous hypodermic and made me count to thirty-five. Thirty-five tigers, thirty-five bowls of fruit. She taught me to walk when I fell across the bed. My colt's leg stiff, unrooted, my face pressed into the sand-white apron of her lap. My bag is gone, my poor man's plastic bag with watch and books and oil. But my shape is there, sculptured in the sand. The rebirth is over and I can see again. I can talk to the beautiful concerned families under their parasols and they shake their heads, offer money, warnings. Twenty yards away I find a neat stack of lotion bottle and paperbacks. The watch, which is cheap but belongs to my daughter, is missing. Now I can walk almost steadily to the surf and clean away the hard car carapace of crystals on my back and feel no fear. Eat the rich, says the lyric in my head. Eat the rich and set them free. 
and I tiptoe into the democracy of the waves with the rosewood grandmothers, the sleek cripple who knifes through a sea that is really quite ludicrously blue. I look at his crutch, still firm in the sand, and all around it now lie the flowers of the surf. Coming out of CNAs, I saw a dead man on the pavement, naked but for a pair of filthy shorts. He lay scrunched up like a ball of paper, his face pressed in the dust, lips fixing the cement with a dry cut kiss. At least he looked as if he should be dead. If so, this was my second corpse. There was one at a bus stop two weeks previously on the main road between Rio and Resende. A man sprawled stiffly, ridiculously in the hammering sun. No one stopped and the traffic poured on. Perhaps that other was not dead. Perhaps the busy shop front on Avenida Nossa Senora de Copacabana was his home. People sleep in boxes here, in cardboard corals on the pavements, on the burnt grass of traffic islands, on the oil stains between parked cars, in the marble porches of banks. Whatever. No one remarked. No one paid the body the slightest heed. I stepped over his legs and made for the bus stop. Now we race across Rio on a bucking 127, clinging to the rail after paying 20 new cruzados, equivalent to 20,000 old cruzados, in notes as dirty and wrinkled as the old British ten bobs I can still remember. Here you enter the body of the bus through a turnstile, that is, if you are lucky and avoid the rush hour. Yesterday, coming back from the botanical gardens, still thinking of the dragonflies and white herons, the smooth bark silky as an erect penis, or the avenue of palms, we had our first confrontation with the thieves who work the bus routes. A girl with the hair of one row and eyes of a barracuda blocked us in the usual melee at the turnstile, whilst other gang members attempted to go through our pockets. When I felt their hands breeze over my body, their practised tugs at the zips of the haversack, for what seemed an age. I was too surprised to move, and then surprised myself by pushing the blonde hard between the breasts and escaping over the turnstile, clicking the wheel. They got nothing, I boasted, squashed into the safety of a seat, along with the secretaries and schoolgirls. The bastards! There's nothing like a Rio bus ride. All of the traffic here is fast and, and impatient, but there's no one more road cynical, not even a Rio tax driver, than a Rio bus driver, cleaving, in uniform of dark glasses, stubble and stick of gum, between the yellow skull of cabs, leaving the Volkswagen shuddering in his wake. The buses are clean, cheap and what's better, frequent. They make the city work. If you catch the wrong one, it's usually no disaster, as long as you get off before being deposited in some scorching slum or favela, which, like enormous houses of cards, have grown up in the hills around the city. Getting off in the centro, or business district, we keep at an appointment at the Berlin. This is a German restaurant with such savage air conditioning that it must be powered by its own nuclear reactor. The word is that it's owned by Nazis, and momentarily it seems possible that the maitre d' is himself an ancient blackshirt, his decayed flunkies regalia greening with age and no less impressive for that. M has a succession of different sucos, orange, papaya and something Amazonian, all divine fruit juices, almost unbearably cold. They must drink these in Valhalla or wherever expired, expired Nazis go. I have a chop. A straw-coloured pilsner sparkling with foam. The glass is a tube of frost. Avocado, salad, sucos, chop. Our guest is Ivo Dorney, Brazilian correspondent for the Financial Times and possessor of an office with perhaps the best view I've ever seen. Rio's harbour, its shipping, the bay with its four forested islands and an immense sky are framed in his window behind a no less impressive savannah of dark desk, immaculate with single penholder and telephone. It is Ivo who bargains with the Nazis, who orders the food, who recommends the drinks. It is Ivo who takes a napkin and draws route maps for us through the rainforest and mountains. 
the slums and red light districts of Rio State. It is Ivo who eats meat while we are indulge in a chaste macrobiotic interlude from the spluttering grills and eye-watering cavazinos. These thimblefuls of diesel of Rio's luncheon stands and it is Ivo who must depart to his eerie between the obsidian plinths of banks and the pinnacles of petroleum companies. Whilst we are still watching our breath cloud over the sucos, the wrinkling eyes of the blonde beer. When the bill arrives on a silver plate, plate held by a liverish Gestapo officer, I find it is thousands and thousands of crusados, more than all the crusados that I folded in my money belt, now cutting a permanent tribute to paranoia into my abdomen. Five times I count what I have, and each time it seems to get smaller. We are the only customers now, and the black uniformed waiters loll against the far wall, like a firing squad ready to go on duty. The subdued music ceased long ago. Whatever you do, goes the advice, don't get involved with the police. Do anything this side of legal that stops you getting too close. I abandon them, frostbitten over her goblet, and pursue the glamorous Ivo to his skyscraper where he is composing a piece on the revolutionary financial plans of the new president, Ferdinand, Ferdinand Collar, whilst making a transatlantic call to his mother. He lends me 15 quid without interrupting either, and after half an hour I am back behind the studded doors of Berlin, where M has shrunk, like the ice in her glass, to a state of transparent, unrecognisable meekness. There are just enough crusados left to hustle our way onto a 119 back towards Copacabana and our hotel deposit safe. Thank you, Dad. That was chapter one. In fact, no one but me is wearing any clothes in Copacabana. Copa <laughs>